Hello and welcome to another episode in the Godot Basics tutorial series. Now, in the last episode, we will be looking at dependency inversion principle, not to be confused with dependency injection. Now, the dependency inversion principle states that high level classes should not depend on low level classes and both should depend on abstractions and abstractions should not depend on details. Details should depend on abstractions. So we have pseudocode and we're going to look at a way on how we can break dependency inversion principle. So we have two classes. We have a shield enemy class and a mage enemy class, and they have a function for attacking. The shield enemy class has a shield attack and a mage enemy class has a fire attack. And even though they have the name enemy in their class names, they are not related in any way. They are not inheriting from a base class. These are separate classes, independent classes. Now we're inside a different class and we import both of our classes in our previous slide over here. So we go ahead and create class instance objects from the shield enemy class and the mage enemy class. Again, noting that they are not inheriting from anything. They are their own independent classes. And in this third class, where we created the instance objects in the previous slide, we want to have a function that calls all the enemies attack functions. So what we do is we have a shield and we call the shield attack method and we have the mage instance object and we call the fire attack method from it. And this is how we, in a sense, break dependency inversion. One, we are directly calling the methods. There's no abstraction. So how do we get that layer of abstraction? Well, what we do in most cases in, in other programming languages is we use interfaces. As a matter of fact, the dependency inversion, the open and closed principle, the interface segregation principle, they all rely on interfaces as solutions. So again, in GDScript, we do not have interfaces. We do use inheritance. So what we do is we create a base enemy class and we have a function that the children should override. So this is step one, create a base class with a function we will abstract in our subclasses. And I will show you that next. So our shield enemy class overrides the attack function. And in it, we put our local function shield attack. And that's how we create the abstraction. So the abstraction comes from when a class instance object is created, we have a method that other classes can call, but they don't necessarily need to care about what's inside. And you can see in the mage enemy class, we also inherit from the base enemy class, and we also override the attack function with the fire attack. Again, this is because we want other classes that use our shield enemy class and our mage enemy class inside of instance objects to have a function that they can call, but not care about what's going on inside. And so in our third class, it doesn't matter what that third class is, it could be any class really, what we should do is have an array, and our array should have all the objects of our enemy subclasses. And simply what we do is we just have a for loop for objects in our array. We just simply call objects.attack, and this is pseudocode, so keep that in mind. But this is in essence what the dependency inversion should look like. And this should say fix, so one moment, there we go. So this solution should in fact fix our dependency inversion because one, we don't really rely on knowing the specific attack function that we're getting from our subclasses. Instead, we call a general attack function and we don't really care what it does in our third class, which is what this example is inside of. We only care that one, our objects have an attack function and two, that it in fact does something. And that's basically the simplest way of solving for dependency inversion. So one, classes that depend on other classes should use some form of abstraction. Now, if you're a beginner, this is most likely too much to handle, and that's okay. Just consider this as a milestone you want to one day reach in terms of your programming abilities. It's not a big deal if you do not apply the dependency inversion. It's okay to do what our first example did, which broke it, but it's okay to do that when you're beginning. And as a matter of fact, I implore you to just figure out a solution rather than clean code, especially if you're a beginner. 
Now, obviously, the pros of dependency inversion is code is decoupled, therefore reusable, like in our for loop example. Now, there are negatives, obviously more overhead, as you would have to create individual functions that act as a layer of abstraction for other classes to use. However, in most cases, this cost does not outweigh the benefits. Let's go ahead and take a look at some code. So in this example, I'm going to show you a problem that we sometimes run into when programming. And then I'm going to show you a design solution using the dependency inversion principle. So I have two files, the bad class file and the bad manager file. And in our bad class file, I have a class name bad class, so we can globally access this class. And I have a function called unique attack. And all it does is it returns an integer, in this case 10. Now, let's pretend that we've been programming for a few months. And this is the function we refer to in this class when we want to get an attack's value. So looking at the bad manager class, in this example, you can see that we are creating an instance object of the bad class using the new method. And in our ready function, we want to print to the screen the value. In this case, it's bad object dot unique attack. But let's say, imagine one day, six months later, you decide to create a new function that's going to replace the old function. So what you would end up doing is you would end up either changing the functionality in the old function, which you may not want to do because you don't want to necessarily break code, what you would rather do is create a new function and then have this function replace in the instance object method calls. So let's go ahead and take this function. We're going to go to bad manager and we're going to replace it. And now when we run our ready function, it's going to call our new update attack. But as you can see here, we had to go inside bad manager class and actually change code. Now imagine if you have to update 100 different classes, you'd have to go into each one and manually change the code. And this is what the dependency inversion tries to solve through abstraction. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Okay, now we are looking at the good files. So we have a good class file and a good manager class file. And for our good class, we give it the class name good class, so it's globally accessible. And using the dependency inversion, we create what's called an abstracted layer. So in this case, our abstracted layer is just this one function, and we called it global attack. And the whole point of this is that when we call the function of this class that returns back a value, we are going to call our global attack function. We're going to call our abstracted function. Now, the whole point of this is that we only have to change code in one place, in this case, the good class, and it propagates up. And that's what the dependency inversion tries to solve. It makes sure that we don't have to manually edit code, but rather by editing code in one place, it propagates to every other place that calls on the function. So I'm going to show you an example. So pretend we still have that function unique attack and this is what we started in our project. And as you can see here, we're going to return unique attack. Now in our good manager class file, we go ahead and we create a class instance of good class. And in our ready function, we print the global attack. Now imagine we have 100 objects that rely on the global attack. And six months later, you decide that you need a new attack function. Well, you go ahead, you create your attack function. And what you do is you update code in the abstracted function, which is considered the abstracted layer. And now we return the new value that returns from the new update attack function. However, because all the other classes are referencing the global attack function when they create a class instance object of our good class, what happens is we don't have to change code. So in our good manager class, notice how even though we change code in our good class file, we don't have to change any code outside of it. And this is what the abstraction layer is for and a popular choice when programming classes. Now there is one problem because we are using Godot GD script, we do not have access to private and protected variables. So the dependency inversion really shines in languages that support private keywords because normally our unique attack would be private, our new update attack would be private, and our function global attack would be public. 
So outside of this class in other languages, the good manager class would only have access to the global attack. That's all the good manager class can see when it creates an instance object of good class. And so therefore, this is the only function that classes outside of good class can call. However, in GDScript, because we don't have private keywords, we still have access to the other functions our class provides. So when programming in Godot GDScript, you have to make sure you stay consistent in what you call. So in this case, we have the underscore, and that's all you really need to do to let yourself know or remind yourself and remind other programmers know that these functions should not be called outside the good class file. So again, you use the underscore. This denotes a sort of pseudocode for private functions and private variables. And so therefore, in our good manager class, when we try to call the method, we won't accidentally pick the classes or rather the functions unique attack and new updated because we're trying to stay consistent and trying to stick to our abstracted function, which is global attack. So again, dependency inversion through an abstracted layer in this case, our abstracted function will go ahead and call the code inside. We only have to change one line of code, or rather we just have to change one area in our code base, and it propagates up to classes that use the abstracted function. And so it makes our life easier. In the bad example, if we had 100 objects, we would have to manually change 100 lines of code uh, theoretically. And in this case, we only have to update or change one section of our class file in good class, and it propagates to all 100 objects that are created from the good class. It's a little hard, again, in Godot GDScript to apply this. However, if you stay consistent with the underscore keyword denoting functions that should not be called outside the GDScript class, you'll find that coding becomes much easier. Well, that's all I have for you in this episode. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Have an amazing day.